In this next video, we'll take a look at the first scope of the GAP audit called Farm Review. Remember, saying Scope 1 is the same as saying Part 1, as the terms are used interchangeably. This section will address water quality assessment, sewage treatment, animal, wildlife, and livestock, manure and biosolid management, soil content, and traceability. Water quality has to do with the amount of potentially harmful microbes you have in your water. GAP does not have a specific requirement for microbial levels, but many farms adopt local industry standards like those set out by the California and Arizona Leafy Greens Marketing Agreements. GAP specifies the number of times you must test your water each year based on the type of water source. Sources include municipal, ground, or well water, and surface water. Local water testing labs should be able to help you test for E. coli, which is a good indicator of pathogens in your water. Let's listen to a quick clip of an audit at Strike Farm. Especially notice how Dylan, the farm owner, asks a question at the end. It's important to remember that the internal auditor is a resource. Although they won't tell you what to do, they can be helpful in clarifying rules you must follow as your farmer. So there's a couple of questions about uh, water quality testing, and that's one of the biggest concerns is making sure you're irrigating with water that is of high enough quality in terms of especially the E. coli in it. Um, mm -hmm. So can you tell me about your, your system that you have here at Stuckey and then how it's, how it's irrigating the fields, if it's overhead or drip, stuff like that, and then uh, about your water test as well, where you got that from and what the results were. Great. So this is our pump house. We do have a well. It's just a 35 gallon per minute residential well. Um, and we run both overhead, uh, three inch line, and uh, drip irrigation off of this well. Um, and we do an annual test to make sure we're with a local lab here in town to make sure that um, the water is still good to go and for the last four years it has been. Um, and we decided to go with the new FISMA rules coming down and it being unclear on how much water testing you'll have to do, um, we decided to go with the GAP, what GAP recommends and so we test this once a year since this is a well to make sure that we're still sitting good. Um, our other property, or one of our other properties, we are pulling from an irrigation ditch. Um, and so that requires a little more testing um, three times a year. And um, the, the first test that we did, that one was actually clear, but we're also growing crops over there that are just for winter storage. It's just carrots and beets that are getting overhead water. Um, and then our cabbage and onions, we're running on drip over there to reduce any risk um, if something were to come through the water. But there's also um, intervals between irrigation and harvest that we're able to, if we did need to grow something over there that wasn't one of the storage crops, um, we could do it. but with our three, actually four properties now, um, three of them have wells and one doesn't, and so we're kind of just keeping our crops that are lower risk on the uh, water that we're drawing out of an irrigation ditch. Great. And how are you determining which crops were lower lower risk and which were higher? So the, the root vegetables are, um, the crops that we are overhead irrigating with the ditch water and with those we're not going to harvest immediately after we irrigate um, and we honestly don't harvest any of them until late fall um, and at that point we won't have irrigated for a while before the um, actual harvest. Um, the ones I don't want to grow with ditch water um, are, we do a lot of baby greens and so those a really short cropping cycle um, so I need to be able to harvest right when I need to harvest yeah. um, there's a very short window um, basically anything that people are going to eat raw um, like the carrots and beets people are going to be peeling um, and I mean all produce everyone's supposed to wash themselves but they are a, a much lower risk and we also do a, another wash of those in our pack shed, um, which we do with our greens too, but it's just a much higher risk, um, especially with the baby greens, just splash from the soil, like they do have soil on them, um, and so I'd rather use water that is totally clean um, 
and not wait for that time period that they maybe could be all right. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So on those three watering uh, or water tests you have to do for surface water, can you remind me what the intervals are or when you need to take those tests throughout the season? Yeah, so it sounds like the ones you've done so far have been at the right time. It's uh, when you about when you plant and then at peak irrigation and then at around harvest time. And of course, for mixed crop vegetables, that's going to be different times. You're obviously harvesting continuously and, all, and as well as peak irrigation, that's going to be pretty continuous. Um, but you want to try and get that around the time when you start to really harvest the bulk of your crop so you have a sense of a good profile throughout your season and it's not packed into one part of your season in case the water is going to change at all. But it sounds like what you've been doing so far is right on. So, great. Animals, wildlife, and livestock need to be managed under the GAP system in order to prevent them from entering vegetable production areas. Things like regular fence checks will help you determine if animals may be entering your production areas. So Dylan, a couple of the questions asked here about how you're managing the presence of wildlife or domestic animals in the field. And it looks like this field doesn't have a, a field perimeter, but I saw in your plan that you had that you'd uh, do a, a field perimeter check, which is usually annual, that you'd be doing that weekly, and then you would do a uh, pre-harvest risk assessment each time you did a harvest as well. So you can just, could you just clarify that and talk about that? Yep. Yeah, so this property we don't, our other properties we have deer fences up, and so we do the annual check. Uh, here without the fence, um, we do a weekly field perimeter walk and see if there's any signs of any sort of wildlife or domestic animals, if, it, if our neighbor's horses bust through, or the sheep when we have them, things like that. Um, and we haven't, we haven't had any issues um, this year, but we still check uh, to make sure. And for our, uh, on the harvest days, we do an in-field pre-harvest assessment. Um, and that's basically the crops we're harvesting will run through. Um, and this is, we also do it the day before because we're getting inventory for what we will have the following day. So we kind of have a good visual of what's there and we can see if there's any red flags. Um, and if there is a red flag, well, uh, if there's bird droppings or um, uh, dead gopher, whatever it is, um, we'll flag off that area and we won't harvest from there. Um, so we do that pre-harvest assessment, but we also, all of our employees know the things to look for. And so if our harvest manager didn't notice something, employees know to notify the harvest manager and help block off that area and we'll just skip that section if there's a spot that has, um, it's usually the only thing we run into is bird droppings. Yep. Great. Sounds good. Manure needs to be carefully managed. The three main considerations with manure are storage, processing, and application. Raw manure, this includes the pile of manure that's been sitting out for five years, needs to be stored in a manner that will not leach into production areas when it becomes wet. Raw manure must also be processed in a specific, well-defined manner if you wish to use it as compost. If it has not been processed in this manner, it must continue to be treated as raw, even if it has been sitting out for five years. For application, raw manure must be applied two weeks prior to planting and 120 days prior to harvest. Keep in mind that if you have unusual weather, like an abnormally hot summer, crops may ripen faster than anticipated. Think of tomatoes ripening quickly on the vine and being ready to harvest 115 days after you apply manure in early spring. Depending on your operation, auditors will want to see treatment logs, records of sources for manure or compost, records demonstrating the microbial safety of compost, and application logs. So Dylan, we're here at your other field and a couple of the questions in the audit are pertaining to manure and livestock. And I know that for your fields, you're using different fertility uh, other than raw manure, but as far as li livestock on your properties, this looks like the only one, the only property that has livestock. I wonder if you could tell me about how they're uh, integrated into your system and how you keep them separate from your crops, things like that. Definitely. So the sheep here, we are using to terminate our cover crop. Um, which we keep about a third of our acreage in cover crop every year. Um, and these are actually from MSU. We're part of a study on terminating with sheep versus tilling and looking at the microbial community differences. Um, so we're able to partner on that project, but also it is a beneficial thing that we want to get in our system is 
having animals in our rotation, which is about a six year rotation, two of the six years being full season cover crop. And so we only use livestock on the fields that are in that full season cover crop. Um, so we manage those separately from the field. Um, and to keep the sheep and the manure out of our vegetable fields, um, we use fencing um, and we have a buffer beyond that. So we have like 50 feet right here um, between the fence and the sheep. Um, and if we, um, if and when we till the field after the sheep are done, um, we clean the tractor tires between doing any tillage where there was manure um, in the last couple months before going in to a field where we're growing vegetables for this year. And then what's the window between when there are sheep in an area and then when you're planting and then harvesting? Crops um, so it's 120 days, it's kind of what we go by, but since this is in our cover crop field, it's actually almost an entire year before we're harvesting anything. Yep. Um, and we do that just to simplify it, that we're not trying to have to push that window. It's basically the last time animals will be in here is this time of year, late August. Um, and we won't be, the very earliest we would be harvesting anything would be next June. Okay, great. So the, the gap window again would be that 120 days, like you said, which is different than your organic certification which does allow for the 90 and then two weeks prior to planting it just sounds like you're way beyond that and, and totally safe there so that's good. yeah yeah try to just keep it simple yeah um so the the biggest thing with gap is livestock behavior and areas need to be somehow divided from your produce areas and if you're going in between the two that's usually a problem if there's no step of managing the potential cross contamination um, with free range chickens the the consideration is that in terms of your footwear um, and it's recommended that you change your footwear oftentimes that's one of the simpler ways because a boot bath becomes monitoring and, and chemicals and it's just a lot to do potentially um, and then the other thing with chickens is and we talked about this a little bit yesterday is do they have access to your produce area if they're free um, and Chris was suggesting that they, they really are never up there and um, the fence obviously they probably could get in there so as the auditor I, know, I, I put wire to close off the spaces at chicken height but I mean in terms of flight, getting over that height. Offense. It's kind of interesting, they can fly up and unless I'm chasing them, they won't pop through, they yeah. can't get a perch to force through. Yeah, yeah so. So my sense is they yeah. probably they yeah. probably can't get in there and no. Chris has told me that they don't. Um, but that would be something that, um, as the auditor, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the fact that Chris is aware of it and he's managing it and he monitors that. Um, so he can tell me, no, they're not in there. Uh, so free range chickens are not great as, as far as, as having them around, as far as a gap standpoint, but it's something you can manage. It's not something that's a huge problem if it exists. Um, same thing with if you have other livestock, if you're going to go out and feed in the morning, you don't want to be walking through your livestock area and then going straight into your hoop house or whatever it might be and starting to do your produce stuff. So having a different set of boots, um, whatever that might be, it's probably the best option that I've seen. The other thing is if you have... Um, as the auditor, if I'm seeing feed in the same area as, as you have produce, I'm assuming that interaction takes place. So I'm going to look for something like a, uh, a procedure that you're going to have in your plan that says we're going to always change our boots when we move from livestock areas to produce and just separating those behaviors during the day. Um, so the first thing is um, compost is mentioned in the, in the food safety plan. Mm -hmm. uh, raw animal waste was never applied to cultivated fields, whether dormant or inactive production. Any compost pr uh, produced on site was re turned regularly and maintained at an internal temperature exceeding 160 degrees for at least two weeks. So my question for Chris would be, under the GAP system, uh, raw manure waste can be applied to fields if, if you desire it. Um, it simply uh, has to be treated as raw manure and must be applied two weeks prior to planting or 124 or 120 days before harvest. Or you can uh, keep records of composting, which, ha which are specified in the GAP system. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to make sure for Chris that um, he understood the difference between those two and then also that compost has to be treated a, a really specific way with temperature logs uh, and turning logs as well and that those temperatures and timings are, are specified in the gap system um, so one of the things we talked about yesterday is where is where his compost is coming from and we talked about 
Uh, it's coming from WSU and they have records for turning. So that for me as a gap auditor is adequate. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so that was in there. Um, this is the first year we came up with a written food safety plan. Yep. And that actually, when we had our own compost piles, was year two. And I got it from a horse sanctuary over yep. the hill and several dump truck loads. And we weren't very systematic about it. But that was sort of the background for what we yep. had done prior to switching over to the WSU. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the great things actually for me as the auditor to see in Chris's plan is he, is he has a lot of what he used to do in, in there as well and the, and the steps that he took and the t decisions he made to change. So some of these things as the auditor, because they're in there, I'm just clarifying, okay, you're not doing this anymore. This is how you've changed. Um, so that's just to clarify that. Soil's questions pertain to the history of the land. With food safety, we're less concerned with the nutrient availability in our soils. So for these purposes, it's more important to understand how the land was used previously and whether any flooding may have resulted in biological, physical, or chemical buildup in the soil. Traceability addresses the chain from field to final consumer. Traceability systems utilize lot numbers to keep track of produce. One lot number consists of a set of harvested produce that is handled in a similar manner during a specific amount of time. All the kale harvested from the Northwest field on September 28th, for example. Auditors will check to make sure each lot number contains information about the harvest location, and they will check to ensure you are able to determine which customers received produce from that lot number. Let's so Dylan, we were just in your cooler and I noticed two things that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, one is on the far wall, it looks like there are a number of boxes that were dated previous to today. And I just wanted to see and check in about your traceability system and how that is working with that. And then also there were some cherries back in the back corner, um, which I assume you're not growing since you didn't see any cherry trees. So I'm curious how you're bringing that in, how you're making sure that is okay to have in your cooler, or how you're keeping things separate in the cooler. Yep. Yeah, so the area you saw on the back wall it's basically our cooler inventory. So we're harvesting seven days a week. So some things will be in the cooler for two or three days before they go out or before we receive an order for them. And so we're holding temperature there to keep product quality high and the produce as fresh as possible. Um, and the lot number on those boxes is the lot number from the day they were harvested. Um, and so when we if they're not already packaged up in their wholesale box with that label, if it's a bulk bin, we transfer the lot number that's on that bin onto the finished box with its label. Uh, all right, so on our boxes, we have the lot number. Or, so when we take something out of that cooler inventory, we have the field lot number on there. And when we repackage it, we transfer that lot number onto our final label for the final package. So we have a complete continuous flow from the field, knowing where things came from, what day. Um, and at the end of every day, after all of our accounts orders are put together, we have another sheet that has um, every product for that day and every account that it goes to. And so we go through each account's pallet, their stack of boxes, and write the number on the box on that sheet so that we have a full record of every day and every count, everything that we do. Um, we can have that on one piece of paper. Great, so it sounds like the lot numbers are being associated with the, pro the, with the orders that they're filling. Eventually. Exactly. That's great. And then what about the cherries in the back corner? How, how did you guys decide yeah. to get that in? How are you keeping so that separate? The cherries we brought in from Western Montana Growers Co-op um, and they're a GAP certified uh, distributor. Great. Um, and so we're able to keep our GAP, um, uh, GAP standards up. Because they're certified. Because they're certified, yeah. Great. So we know that they're doing what they need to do. Yeah. And we keep those separate in our cooler from uh, stuff that we're bringing in. So we, it's pretty easy with the cherries, because uh, we don't grow cherries. Yeah. Um, but if we had a product that wasn't from a GAP certified, producer, we would have to have a separate separate way of dealing that. Um, and we, it's the only place that we actually buy in from are GAP certified places. So Great. again, that simplifies it. Yeah. Great. Thank you.